Hatchet, Chapter 6 Two years before, he and Terry had been fooling around down near the park, where the city seemed to end for a time, and the trees grew thick and came down to a small river that went through the park. It was thick there, and seemed kind of wild, and they'd been joking and making things up, and they pretended that they were lost in the woods and talked in the afternoon about what they would do. Of course, they figured they'd have all sorts of goodies like a gun and a knife and fishing gear and matches so they could hunt and fish and have a fire. I wish you were here, Terry, he thought, with a gun and a knife and some matches. In the park that time, they had decided the best shelter was a lean-to, and Brian set out now to make one up. Maybe cover it with grass or leaves or sticks, he thought and he started to go down to the lake again, where there were some willows he could cut down for braces. But it struck him that he ought to find a good place for the lean-to, and so he decided to look around first. He wanted to stay near the lake because he thought the plane, even deep in the water, might show up to somebody flying over, and he didn't want to diminish any chance he might have of being found. His eyes fell upon the stone ridge to his left, and he thought of first he should build his shelter against the stone. But before that, he decided to check out the far side of the ridge, and that was where he got lucky. Using the sun and the fact that it rose in the east and set in the west, he decided that the far side was the northern side of the ridge. At one time in the far past, it had been scooped by something, probably a glacier, and this scooping had left a kind of sideways bowl back in under a ledge. It wasn't very deep, not a cave, but it was smooth and made a perfect roof, and he could almost stand in it under the ledge. He had to hold his head slightly tipped forward at the front to keep it from hitting the top. Some of the rock that had been scooped out had also been pulverized by the glacial action, turning it into sand, and now made a small sand beach that went down to the edge of the water in front and to the right of the overhang. It was his first good luck. No, he thought. He'd had good luck in the landing, but this was good luck as well. Luck he needed. All he had to do was wall off part of the bowl and leave an opening as a doorway, and he would have a perfect shelter, much stronger than lean-to and dry because the overhang made a watertight roof. He crawled back in under the ledge and sat. The sand was cool here in the shade, and the coolness felt wonderful to his face, which was already starting to blister, and get especially painful on his forehead, with the blisters on top of the swelling. He was also still weak. Just the walk around the back of the ridge and the slight climb over the top had left his legs rubbery. It felt good to sit for a bit under the shade of the overhang in the cool sand. And now, he thought, if I just had something to eat, anything... When he had rested a bit, he went back down to the lake and drank a couple of swallows of water. He wasn't all that thirsty, but he thought the water might help to take the edge off his hunger. It didn't. Somehow, the cold lake water made it worse, sharpened it. He thought of dragging in wood to make a wall on part of the overhang and picked up one piece to pull it, but his arms were too weak, and he knew then that it wasn't just the crash and injury to his body and head. It was also that he was weak from hunger. He would have to find something to eat. Before he did anything else, he would have to have something to eat. But what? Brian leaned against the rock and stared out at the lake. What in all of this was there to eat? He was so used to having food just be there, just always being there. When he was hungry, he went to the icebox, or to the store, or sat down to a meal his mother cooked. Oh, he thought, remembering a meal now, oh, it was last Thanksgiving, last year, the last Thanksgiving they had as a family before his mother demanded the divorce and his father moved out in the following January. Brian already knew the secret, but did not know it would cause them to break up and thought it might work out. The secret that his father still did not know but that he would try to tell him when he saw him. The meal had been turkey, and they cooked it in the backyard in the barbecue over charcoal with the lid down tight. 
His father had put hickory chips on the charcoal and the smell of the cooking turkey and the hickory smoke had filled the yard. When his father took the lid off, smiling, the smell that had come out was unbelievable. And when they sat to eat, the meat was wet with juice and rich and had the taste of the smoke in it. He had to stop this. His mouth was full of saliva and his stomach was twisting and growling. What was there to eat? What had he read or seen that told him about food in the wilderness? Hadn't there been something? A show, yes, a show on television about Air Force pilots and some kind of course they took. A survival course. All right, he had the show coming into his thoughts now. The pilots had to live in the desert. They put them in the desert down in Arizona or someplace, and they had to live for a week. They had to find food and water for a week. For water, they made a sheet of plastic in a dew-gathering device, and for food, they ate lizards. That was it. Of course, Brian had lots of water, and there weren't too many lizards in the Canadian woods that he knew. One of the pilots had used a watch crystal as a magnifying glass to focus the sun and start a fire so they didn't have to eat the lizards raw. But Brian had a digital watch without a crystal, broken at that. So the show didn't help him very much. Wait, there was one thing. One of the pilots, a woman, had found some kind of beans on a bush, and she used them with her lizard meat to make a stew in a tin can she had found. Bean lizard stew. There weren't any beans here, but there must be berries. There had to be berry bushes around. That's what everybody always said. Well, he'd actually never heard anybody say it, but he felt that it should be true. There must be berry bushes. He stood and moved out into the sand and looked up at the sun. It was still high. He didn't know what time it must be. At home, it would be one or two if the sun were that high. At home, at one or two, his mother would be putting away the lunch dishes and getting ready for her exercise class. No, that would have been yesterday. Today, she was going to see him. Today was Thursday and she always went to see him on Thursdays. Wednesday was the exercise class, and Thursdays she went to see him. Hot little jets of hate worked into his thoughts, pushed once, moved back. If his mother hadn't begun to see him and force the divorce, Brian wouldn't be here now. He shook his head, had to stop that kind of thinking. The sun was still high, and that meant that he had some time before darkness to find berries. He didn't want to be away from his, he almost thought of it as home, shelter, when it came to be dark. He didn't want to be anywhere in the woods when it came to be dark, and he didn't want to get lost, which was a real problem. All he knew in the world was the lake in front of him and the hill at his back and the ridge. If he lost sight of them, there was a really good chance that he would get turned around and not find his way back. So he had to look for berry bushes, but keep the lake or the rock ridge in sight at all times. He looked up the lake shore to the north. For a good distance, perhaps 200 yards, it was fairly clear. There were tall pines, the kind with no limbs until very close to the top, with a gentle breeze sighing in them, but not too much low brush. 200 yards up, there seemed to be a belt of thick, lower brush starting, about 10 or 12 feet high, and that formed a wall he could not see through. It seemed to go on around the lake, thick and lushly green, but he could not be sure. If there were berries, they would be in that brush, he felt, and as long as he stayed close to the lake, so he could keep the water on his right and know it was there, he wouldn't get lost. When he was done or found berries, he thought, he would just turn around so the water was on his left and walk back until he came to the ridge and his shelter. Simple. Keep it simple. I'm Brian Robeson. I've been in a plane crash. I'm going to find some food. I'm going to find some berries. He walked slowly, still a bit pained in his joints and weak from hunger, up along the side of the lake. The trees were full of birds singing ahead of him in the sun. Some he knew, some he didn't. He saw a robin and some kind of sparrows and a flock of reddish-orange birds with thick beaks. Twenty or thirty of them were sitting in one of the pines, 
They made much noise and flew away ahead of him when he walked under the trees. He watched them fly, their color a bright slash in solid green, and in this way, he found the berries. The birds landed in some taller willow type of undergrowth with wide leaves and started jumping and making noise. At first, he was too far away to see what they were doing, but their color drew him, and he moved toward them, keeping the lake in sight on his right, and when he got closer, he saw they were eating the berries. He could not believe it was that easy. It was as if the birds had taken him right to the berries. The slender branches went up about 20 feet and were heavy, drooping with clusters of bright red berries. They were half as big as grapes, but hung in bunches, much like grapes, and when Brian saw them, glistening red in the sunlight, he almost yelled. His pace quickened, and he was in them in moments, scattering the birds, grabbing the branches, stripping them to fill his mouth with berries. He almost spit them out. It wasn't that they were bitter so much as they lacked any sweetness, had a tart flavor that left his mouth feeling dry, and they were like cherries in that they had large pits, which made them hard to chew. But there was such a hunger on him, such an emptiness, that he could not stop and kept stripping branches and eating berries by the handful, grabbing and jamming them into his mouth and swallowing them, pits and all. He could not stop, and when at last his stomach was full, he was still hungry. Two days without food must have shrunken his stomach, but the drive of hunger was still there. Thinking of the birds and how they would come back into the berries when he left, he made a carrying pouch of his torn windbreaker and kept picking. Finally, when he judged he had close to four pounds in the jacket, he stopped and went back to his camp by the ridge. Now, he thought, now I have some food and I can do something about fixing this place up. He glanced at the sun and saw he had some time before dark. If only I had matches, he thought, looking ruefully at the beach and lakeside. There was driftwood everywhere, not to mention dead and dry wood all over the hill and dead dry branches hanging from every tree. All firewood and no matches. How did they used to do it, he thought. Rub two sticks together? He tucked the berries in the pouch back in under the overhang in the cool shade and found a couple of sticks. After 10 minutes of rubbing, he felt the sticks and they were almost cool to the touch. Not that, he thought. They didn't do fire that way. He threw the sticks down in disgust. So, no fire. But he could still fix the shelter and make it. Here, the word safer came into his mind and he didn't know why. More livable. Kind of close it in, he thought. I'll close it in a bit. He started dragging sticks up from the lake and pulling long, dead branches down from the hill, never getting out of sight of the water on the ridge. With these, he interlaced and wove a wall across the opening of the front of the rock. It took over two hours and he had to stop several times because he still felt a bit weak, and once because he felt a strange new twinge in his stomach. A tightening, rolling. Too many berries, he thought. I ate too many of them. But it was gone soon, and he kept working until the entire front of the overhang was covered, save for a small opening at the right end nearest the lake. The doorway was about three feet, and when he went in, he found himself in a room almost 15 feet long and 8 to 10 feet deep, with a rock wall sloping down at the end. Good, he said, nodding. Good. Outside, the sun was going down, finally, and in the initial coolness, the mosquitoes came out again clouded in on him. They were thick, terrible, if not quite as bad as in the morning, and he kept brushing them off his arms until he couldn't stand it, and then dumped the berries and put the torn windbreaker on. At least the sleeves covered his arms. Wrapped in the jacket with darkness coming down fast now, he crawled back in under the rock, huddled, and tried to sleep. He was deeply tired and still aching some, but sleep was slow coming and did not finally settle in until the evening cool turned to night cool and the mosquitoes slowed. Then at last, with his stomach turning on the berries, Brian went to sleep. And we'll go on with chapter seven in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.